I want you to try and imagine the scene where Mary meets Elizabeth. I want you to hear the exchange between the two of them about what great things God has done for them. And in exchange, he arranges them to express her rejoicing and thanksgiving to God for his blessings. Let's look at that in Luke chapter 1, verses 45 to 56. I'll start at 46. Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he has regard for the humble state of his bondservant. For behold, from this time on all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in thoughts in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to wrong things with regard to Mary because we're forced into it having come from a Catholic background. But here's a good thing. Here's a good thing for all Catholics to know as well as ourselves. And here's a good thing that all Catholics and all Christians can emulate in their lives. I want to say it is hard for us in this secular age to imagine how deeply God-fearing families in Israel were steeped in the Torah, which is the law of Moses, or the law of God. In truth, they ate, they slept, they drank the word of God. And I've no fear of saying it was their life. Moses had commanded this all persuasive approach to scripture for every Israelite, not just for Mary or Joseph, but for everybody. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with verse 4 where he states the great creed of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house, and on your gates. What's he suggesting here to us? What did he suggest to the Israelites? That it's in, insofar as the home life of the Israelite was concerned. Everything was centered around the scriptures. What they talked about was the scriptures, God's word, and how it impacted on their lives, and how it resonated in praise to God and thanksgiving for his righteousness, his justice, and his mercy. So it's, it's a wonderful thing to read this. In Psalm 78, verses 5 through 8, he reiterates the command to teach it to the children for another generation to know, for another generation to be brought up in that all-embracing and all-encompassing um, focus on the Scripture. Psalm 78, beginning with verse 5. 
He says, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. He wanted to remind them in uh, their teaching not to be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not pre prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Monumental lessons from the word of God for all Israelites and for all Christians for that matter as well. I know there's a lot of people who have reared their children and children, their children not necessarily faithful to God and it's very discouraging and very disconcerting for us to have put all that effort in and to, as it were, feel it was wasted. It's never wasted. It's never wasted. The Word of God will do its work and that word can lie in seed form in their hearts until they die. So until now, until that time, that seed could germinate. And what is really necessary for us as parents is to, and as Christians, is to concentrate on our own faithfulness and not let their own faithfulness or unbelief disturb our conviction and our devotion to God. And when the time comes for them to open up their heart to God once more, or maybe even for the first time, then they will know what it is to serve God because they will have seen it in your life, in your faithfulness and your steadfast service to the Lord. But if they don't see that, there will be no draw for them. If we join them, we will just confirm them in their sin and in their rebellion and we will accompany them to the judgment and the wrath to come. Brethren, we need to be steadfast. <coughs> Mary and Joseph would have taken the foregoing commands very seriously and their knowledge and earnestness in teaching their children would have facilitated facilitated the growth of Jesus in the knowledge and wisdom of holy writ. That's important. If we go back to Luke chapter 2, we'll see what Jesus was capable of by the time he was 12 years of age. Now I know people are going to say, well he was God, so uh, there wasn't much teaching uh, in, in this. Uh, but that's not true. He was human as human as you and I. And he had to make choices himself. And he had to immerse himself in the word of God. He chose to do that. They were willing to help him and to give him the instruction in this matter. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 40. It says there, The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was with him. And to give an illustration of how that took place or uh, what resulted in that growing in the grace of God, his parents used to go up to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And on this occasion, they had started their journey back home when obviously a, a good distance into it they realized that Jesus wasn't around and they frantically started to look for him no doubt among the the lines of pilgrims asking if they saw the child if they if they uh, had uh, heard him or if he was with any of their families you know that that's the sort of thing what, that would have went on they got back to Jerusalem and what they found was that uh, in verse 45, recorded for us in verse 45, when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding. 
and his answers. Now, given that he had propensity for righteousness, for the law, given as the fact that as God, he had himself given that law, uh, we can understand why he was so disposed to it. But nevertheless, the child put in the effort to know and to become wise and was able to discuss the scriptures and was able to demonstrate through his questions his deep insight into the word of God and his desire to know more and more about the law of God. So, Joseph and Mary's determination to carry out those commandments from Deuteronomy and from Psalm 78 was evident in the spiritual maturity shown by Jesus even at this very early stage. And brethren, this is the payoff that's proffered to young and old alike who devote themselves to the study of God's word. Look at what Psalm 119 beginning with verse 97 says David writing said oh how I love your law it is my meditation all the day I'm sure we could ascribe that to Mary or to Joseph for that matter your commandments make me wiser than my enemies for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have observed your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. For your, from your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We're wise, we've got insight, we've got understanding from the things that God has taught us in the scriptures. It helps, it helps to keep us away from those things that God hates and make us attracted to the things that God loves and when you're a young man as I was having obeyed the gospel to read these scriptures meant a great deal to me I knew how much I had to learn we come from a background where I was 20 years of age when I obeyed the gospel but I had no knowledge of the word of God. Nothing. I started from zilch. Nothing. But you had to grow up very quickly. Because you had to try and teach others about the gospel. And I wanted to come back and teach the gospel here in my own country. So these words encouraged me. And gave me some confidence. That if this is the payoff for devotion and study that's the pay a payoff I want so that I can deliver the word of God in a way that will help other people and will encourage other people to be faithful to God I ask in the light of Ephesians 6 4 where fathers are told to bring up their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord that you that you make the overlap between what's been said in the Old Testament and what he's actually saying there in the New Testament. We should be like these Old Testament saints. We should be God-fearing families and God-fearing brethren who speak about the Word of God, for whom the Word of God and the Scriptures is their life. Should parents not pray, God make us like Mary, the mother of Jesus, in our determination to study and know your word as revealed to us in your scriptures. And I think we need to give an affirmative answer on that. All right, let's now consider the flesh profits nothing. 
what do you think? Would the fleshly or the spiritual family relationship be more important to God? <clears throat> well, let the scripture answer this. Let's look at Matthew chapter 10. need to get into Matthew, not Mark. Matthew chapter 10, here in verse 37. He says, having told them that he hadn't come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword, having told them that a man would be set against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. He goes on to say in verse 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, for, for people, for, for sensitive parents who really love their children, and have sacrificed their lives for their children. This is, this is a hard thing to accept, and it's a hard thing to implement. But the devil is able to use our children to, like a crowbar, to, to wrench us away from God and from our service to God and our devotion to Jesus Christ and the desire to keep Christ's commandments. So we have to learn a little bit of detachment when it comes to these matters. And I think it's healthy detachment, whether it's from our children, our parents, our relatives, our friends, our workmates, whatever the relationship is, in the family and above and beyond the family, there is no relationship that can be greater than our fellowship with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. No relationship that can be greater. Your children can turn against you and in some cases, as we pointed out already, have turned against us because of our stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you love your father and mother more than me, you are not worthy of me. Don't let what your father and mother stand for or what they believe drag you down to their level. There has to be that detachment, a healthy detachment, because my relationship with Jesus Christ is a relationship that's more important than my relationship with my family. My family relationship has a span that covers my life or their life. When a man and a woman who've been married for a lifetime die, they are no longer married. That relationship is finished. That part of their life is over. They are on their own before God, each one on their own before God. And when that happens, it will be obvious as to what relationship was more important to God and what relationship was more important to us. <clears throat> he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He not only says it about your son and daughter, your father and your mother, he says it about himself, about ourselves. He's saying, in effect, he who loves his own life his own fleshly life, his own earthly life, more than me, is not worthy of me. That's what he's telling us here. We've discussed the idea before 
that this whole idea of self and what I want and what I like and what I desire to do is central to our rebellion against God because we want to make ourselves the king in our own little kingdom and we want to have that right and that authority to decide what's best for me and we will not let God in even though he is the sovereign Lord of all creation and of your life and everything to do with you we will not give over that part of us which is independent and wants to remain independent of God and everybody else so that I can be my own person we've got to realize what I am as a person I must put at the feet of Jesus Christ our Lord we can thank God for what we are but we can also say here's my life Lord I want you to be the authority in my life I want you, your thoughts to be my thoughts your ways to be my ways I want to walk in your righteousness and truth I want to glorify your name Father this is what I'm here for this is what I was created for this I must do the Pharisees with most of the Jews put great store in their acceptance by God because of their kinship with Abraham <coughs> it was like Abraham is our father end of story God accepts us God has chosen us God will reward us end of story but what about you do doesn't matter what I do I am a child of Abraham that was a huge mistake John the Baptist did not decry the blessing of being the fleshly seed of Abraham however he did point out that the true spiritual seed of Abraham will do the deeds of Abraham Jesus said to them if you are Abraham's children do the deeds of Abraham John 8 verse 39 To be Abraham's fleshly seed alone did not guarantee anything because when they refused to do the deeds of Abraham the result was they would be cut down and thrown into the fire according to John the Baptist Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. So they were wrong in thinking I am of the fleshly seed of Abraham and that's all the credentials I need to be acceptable before God and to enter into the kingdom of God God was able to make children to Abraham from the stones no big boast but when it comes to the spiritual seed of Abraham who lived by faith incidentally that's a different matter John therefore demanded of these fleshly Israelites those who are connected to Abraham through the flesh he demanded of those people that they repent and bring forth fruit in keeping with their repentance they already believed in God they needed to repent and to bring forth fruit in keeping with God I might add just as a matter of interest that day of atonement sacrifice which was made once a year for the nation of Israel and for the sins of the people as it was for the sins of the high priest and the sins of the, 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 the other priests and for the tabernacle and all its utensils it's, that was a day of atonement that is the background to all these statements by Jesus that I forgive you of your sins on the basis of what has been done for you in that sacrifice on the basis of your repentance and your faith in me I forgive you of your sins it's just not willy nilly oh, I forgive you of your sins don't worry about that it's an easy thing to say I'll do it for you 
Man, just, I'll, I'll, I'll say it all over the place. <coughs> Sin requires sacrifice. Sin causes pain and hurt. Sin destroys. It cannot be taken lightly. And it is not forgiven flippantly. They had to repent. And by repenting and bringing forth fruit in keeping with their repentance. Very important. A lot of people, oh yeah, I'm sorry for what I've done. And two days later to back to doing what they do. Or the man who's been caught in a crime and is, oh, your honor, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry for it. I, I never really meant it. And, and uh, he's dressed up in his nice suit where he'd wear his trainers and his jeans otherwise. But he makes an impression on the judge and the judge feels sorry for him and lets him go. And he goes, leaves the court laughing. Wasn't sorry at all. Not really. He was sorry he was caught. But he wasn't sorry for doing the wrong. And so it is with, mo with many of us. But, the, but people would prove themselves to be the true spiritual seed of Abraham and acceptable to God by their repentance and their bringing forth fruits. Look at Romans chapter 2. Here's a lesson that Paul gives both to the Jewish Christians and to the Gentile Christians because it was true in both cases. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Verse 28 of uh, Romans chapter 2, sorry. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from man, but from God. Those words would have been understood by a, a Jew, a, a, a genuine Jew, a Jew who understood that the circumcision was really inward and of the heart, not just outward in the flesh. And the Christians would understand that he's saying that we are the true spiritual Jews. Our circumcision is of the whole body. It's spiritual. It's of the spirit. Not of the letter of the law, but of the grace of God. And that our desire is not to praise man or to please man, but to please God Almighty. I want us now to look at, uh, to bring all of this in keeping with the lesson that I'm presenting on uh, Mary here. Let us look at Luke chapter 11 and we'll read verses 27 and 28. Luke chapter 11. While Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Obviously now, this woman was impressed with Jesus' insight and wisdom. And since he had talked about the unclean spirits being cast out and uh, then nothing filling the void there, so he goes away, the unclean spirit goes away and brings seven more spirits more uh, wicked than himself and they come back and inhab inhabit the empty life that existed because that person didn't fill themselves with God and the word of God. But maybe she, maybe she had had a demon cast out of her. And maybe that made a greater impression on her because she would understand what Jesus is talking about. One way or the other, uh, it, uh, that, that really doesn't matter one way or the other. She felt strongly that his mother was blessed by having given birth to Jesus and nursing him. She deemed her, that is Mary, his mother, to be exclusively blessed in her fleshly relationship with Jesus. 
And this, this, is a, this is a problem that persists even to this present day. Because we have the biggest denomination in the world, Catholicism, saying that this fleshly relationship that she bore to Jesus supersedes all relationships and that it has caused her to be glorified in heaven itself, to be called the mother of God, to be prayed to and worshipped. But here's the seeds of it. Even in her desire to acknowledge Jesus, she wanted her, his mother, to be blessed in this way. Jesus w replied, no, but rather. In the, in the Greek you'll see, no, but rather. In the New American Standard Bible it says, on the contrary. So there's a no in this. Jesus is saying no. Now he's not denying that Mary was blessed. Even she herself said, from, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. She understood that. And we understand that too. And Jesus wasn't trying to deny that. But this woman was making that fleshly relationship supersede all other relationships. And Jesus was saying, no, that's not true. It is much truer to say what Jesus goes on to say that those who hear and observe the word of God are those who are the blessed. So just as the family relationship compared to the spiritual relationship with God which would include redemption and the giving of eternal life is much greater this spiritual family relationship is much greater than the mere human relationship that Mary had with Jesus. And that's what he, he wants us to know and that's what he wanted this woman to know. His spiritual family ties involving as it does redemption and eternal life are closer and more important to him than mere family ties. This teaching will become clearer and more fixed in your mind after we read Matthew chapter 12, 46 to 50. While he was still speaking to the crowd, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. Someone said to him, behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Of course, we, we can never be the mother of Jesus. So he's obviously using brother, sister and mother to represent the family. We are his, we are his family. Those who do hear God's word and observe it are acknowledged by Jesus to be his and to be related to him in that family relationship of sons and daughters of the Most High. There can be no question that he's comparing the close relationship of a family unit, a fleshly family unit, which is good and a great blessing and a boon to everyone who has been in a good family and a godly family, a great blessing. But by comparison, the relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ and the spiritual benefits that we receive from that family relationship with him are far greater for now and for eternity. And it is the one relationship that will last through eternity where the family relationship will dissolve at the end of this age or when we die.
All right, I think, I hope that's become clear that, that uh, the flesh profits nothing in these relationships. It is the spirit that is important. There are some things that uh, other things that we can see about Mary which are, which are great. Um, and in order to lead us into this, let's go to Genesis chapter 24, 16. We were talking about uh, Rebecca and how she was brought back from Haran to Israel to marry Abraham's son Isaac. And it says of her in verse 16 of Genesis 24, the girl was very beautiful, a virgin, and no man had had relations with her. Now that's what I want to emphasize here. She was a virgin because no man had had relations with her. We can now take that bit of information and focus on the prophecy of Isaiah about Jesus where he says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated God with us, Isaiah 7.14. Mary pronounced herself a virgin to the angel in the same way Rebecca was a virgin. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 37. After telling her the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Um, where am I here? Verse, sorry, verse 34 is what I want. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? But uh, if we look again in some other translations it says, how will this be since I know not a man? That's the more accurate um, translation of the Greek there how will this be that I can be the mother of the Messiah when I have not known the man it connects with what we read in Genesis uh, chapter 24 verse 16 she was a virgin because she had not known the man and that's very significant and very important even when it speaks about Joseph, after he was told by the angel about uh, Mary conceiving and who she conceived by, we're told in Matthew chapter 1 verse 25 what Joseph did and how he reacted to this whole revelation about Mary and her pregnancy. It says in verse 24, And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife. Now it seems it was important uh, when they took a, a person as their wife that in the marriage ceremony they would go from her father's house and she would be brought, we know from the story of the ten virgins, back to Joseph's house or Joseph's parents' house, depending. So he would bring her to his own house. He may even have slept in the same bed as she was because now they were married. But like Abishag with David, who was his nurse in his old age, she slept beside him to keep him warm, but he had no relationship with her. Joseph would have had no relationship with Mary during this period, even though he was married to her. He kept her a virgin until the child was born. And again, that's very important. Now, you may or may not know, but Leviticus chapter 12, 1 through 4, has a bearing on this period of time in Joseph and Mary's life. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 12, 1 through 4. And Moses 
Well, sorry, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, When a woman gives birth and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean for seven days, as in the days of her menstruation, and she shall be unclean. On the eighth day, the flesh of the foreskin shall be circumcised. Then she shall remain in the blood of her purification for 33 days. She shall not touch any consecrated thing, nor enter the sanctuary until the days of her purification are completed. In other words, when a woman had a child, she was, and it was a male child, she was to be considered unclean in the blood of her purification for 40 days after the birth. In the case of uh, having a daughter, she was to remain unclean for 80 days, twice the amount of time. Now, many women who read this take terrible offense at it. And I know the Catholic Church, when I was a younger man, would impose this on the women who had had a child. And the women f felt very victimized as a result of it. But I don't think the Lord was trying to victimize or hurt anybody. I believe this law was given as a protection for the woman. It meant during that period of time, the husband could have no relations with her life, with his wife, because she was unclean in her blood. And therefore the woman got a break from any demands that the man might have during that period of time and was able to concentrate on feeding her child and looking after her own well-being. So I do believe that the goodness was in the Lord's heart in proscribing this, um, this uh, restriction. And uh, given that uh, we are living in a world now where women have lots of rights and uh, we, we might misunderstand, but you have to put yourself back into that world where women had no rights whatsoever. And you can see how God was protecting them. But anyway, what we know then from this is that for at least 40 days after the birth, at least, there was no relationship between Joseph and Mary. And she remained a virgin in the sense that no man had relationships with her. So that means she was a virgin when she conceived. She was a virgin all through her pregnancy, and she was a virgin for at least 40 days after the child was born. Now why do we believe all of this? Because that's what the scriptures are teaching. That's what the scriptures are teaching. And it's important for us to see there is a difference there is a difference. Let's make a contrast to show you the difference between scripture and legend. By contrast, it is claimed that Mary, after her death, was assumed into heaven. Do we believe this? No. Why not? Because there is nothing about it in the faith once for all handed down to the saints. Jude verse 3. Since we have in the scriptures everything that pertains to life and godliness, the question naturally arises, where is the assumption of Mary into heaven taught a sound doctrine in the gospel or in the scriptures of the New Testament? The answer is nowhere. And that is why Christians are warned to preach the word and not anything else. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 4. Very important scripture for us all, and especially for preachers. Second Timothy chapter four, verses one through four. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who was the judge of the living and the dead, by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Can you not see why preachers have to preach the truth regardless of how offensive it is to other people? Do you not see that they have to preach the tr truth even when other people disagree? 
they are charged before the judge of all the earth, Jesus Christ our Saviour, to preach the word. And of course, preaching the word means preaching nothing else but the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, says to Timothy. And in regard to this assumption into heaven, it is a myth, a legend. It's an it's accepted story, but has no roots in the truth whatsoever. The gospel alone is the power of God unto salvation. It is not part of the gospel. It is not part of the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1 verses 16 and 17. So if the assumption is not from the gospel, where did it come from? It comes from the assumptions of uninspired apocryphal writings or writers. A few of which deal with the assumption narrative. Even Catholics acknowledge that these are myths these, these apocryphal writings are myths, legends, and religious fiction. According to the Apocryphal New Testament by Montague Rhodes James, page 194 to 227, the assumption uh, is based on six separate documents, all differing in the details of the story and are of widely different dates. They are the Coptic text. The discourses of Theodosius, the Greek narrative, the Latin narrative of Pseudo Malito, the narrative of Joseph of Arimathea, another, they tag on names to what they've written to give it some respectability, <coughs> names that would have been familiar from the scriptures. You have the Syriac version, which is the sixth that it's based on. So the false doctrine of the assumption of Mary into heaven is just an assumption of uninspired men. No real assumption. An assumption of uninspired men who have transformed it into a dogma to be believed by the so-called faithful. And since Mary is not in heaven, she is not the woman in the vision of Revelation chapter 12. They make a big deal about this is Mary, the stars around her head. Even the, even the statues of Mary have that image of the stars around her head and, and standing on the, uh, on the world and so forth. But she is not even in heaven, no more than those who have gone before us are in heaven. She's in Hades, hopefully in paradise in Hades, opened to the Lord and fellowship with him but she is not in heaven and since she is not in heaven she's not the woman of the vision of Revelation 12 she is not the queen of heaven regardless of what they claim she cannot answer our prayers because she is a human and not in position to answer any of our prayers there is just one mediator between God and man we know from the scriptures the man Christ Jesus. One. First Timothy 2 5. The New Testament speaks of one human in the throne of God, and that is the Lamb of God. Revelation 7:17. 7, Let's have a look there. It's good to just have a look, and we'll finish up with this just now. Revelation 7 17. It says, for the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to the springs of the waters of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Since it was the human life that was given as a sacrifice for the sins of the world, the lamb in the center of the throne is the human life of our Lord Jesus Christ. The only human life that's associated with the throne scene 
and there will never be any other human associated with the authority and the glory and the power of God because this human was the Son of God, was the Word that was with God and was God from all eternity and now has returned to the glory which he ever shared with the Father from the very beginning. So here's the, the only one that's there. Mary is not there. Too many people have closed their eyes to the Word of God and have turned aside to myths. And anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. 2 John 9. Brethren, it's important for us to disentangle the myths from the truths in God's Word. And when we do, we are the clearer in our understanding and we are in a position then to teach the truth of God's Word more accurately. So for all of those reasons, I've presented these facts and myths about the mother of Jesus. Of course, there's much more to be dealt with, but that's as much as I can deal with this morning, and it's probably as much as you can take anyway, so we'll leave it there for today.